Before we begin, I need to get a couple things out of the way. One, as always, when we have um, David on the show, um, and I guess to a certain extent Nathan as well, and, and that has nothing to do with anything other than the fact that these two gentlemen have lived pretty unique um, and amazing, crazy lives. Uh, for better or worse, I just think that like you can't <laughs> you can't deny them that. So. Uh, this is an interview. I'm going to let them talk. I was going to do a podcast that had all these graphics and things that like all the receipts that are everything, blah, blah, blah. but I had to do a two-parter, I think. Um, so tonight I'm going to allow Nathan Jacobson and David Wallace in their own words, speak to the events that they're familiar with that surround the Sherman murders and or the investigation. And I am approaching it uh, despite having read all this material and having been kind of slowly digesting it for months, I am approaching this interview as if I am blind and I have never heard of any of this. And I think that that is doing the audience a service. And so that is the approach I'm taking. I regret nothing. And here tonight to discuss this case, the Sherman murders is David Wallace and Nathan Jacobson. I think <laughs> Nathan. Oh wait, you're tech. There you are, buddy. Just waiting for for you to send me that link. Yeah, it's coming. It's coming, buddy. Okay. It's it's been a long day. Um, I'm gonna start off uh, on something that's completely unrelated, and that is that um, my boss at the library that I work at retired, and I have a new dilemma. Um, my dilemma is that my boss, I she i respected her i worked with her for six years at a library she was a librarian and i respected her and i did a good job i didn't like do my own work a lot and this and that and now that she's gone the person that replaced her i'm noticing that i can get away with a lot more and i'm doing it so i i'm just throwing that out there in case anyone can give me advice on how to keep this job that uh, that i've had for six years um nathan do a I good job. Right now, i just emailed you the link okay Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, and good luck to Karen Filipkowski, my uh, old boss at the library. The Sherman murders. Guys, I, I don't think that Canada has seen a case quite like this before. Um, David, can you do me a favor? And before we even get into the things that are going to be said uh, for the first time about this case tonight, and from an angle that I don't think anyone's really talked about, um, Give me a sense, if you would, because I know that you know a lot about this case, of why this case is peculiar from the start. And I'm talking about how they found the scene and how it was reported versus how the police were kind of talking about it. Can you, can you, are you familiar enough to give us sort of like a little bit of a bullet point session on what makes this case a little peculiar or a lot peculiar? Well, um, the initial reports were... Um both wildly inaccurate and um, completely accurate um, in terms of they believed it was a murder, uh, homicide murder, um, and then a suicide. Uh, it wasn't. It was double homicide, but uh, it was definitely targeted. And uh, my belief through the uh, investigation um, that I did uh, when I was working uh, for one of the investigators on the case, uh, the lead investigator, uh, Tom Clatt, uh, what I believed was that this was uh, not a crime of passion, not a crime of revenge. It was basically the final touches on a robbery on a mass scale. Okay, let's leave that there. Um, just hanging like the ridiculous monster it is. <laughs> just leave that there for a second. Um, the 
tell us how you got involved in the case because because uh, even i was just like oh my gosh like the sherman case? david you're in that too because but and at first i was like did he insert himself in this case somehow and then you know finagle which i would have been like you know impressed but it wasn't like that you, you were you met now g g can you give our audience an idea of who clat is uh tom clat he's a uh, former toronto uh police uh, homicide detective legendary detective um and i guess you would call him the private investigator to the uh stars the powerful he's uh, extremely good at what he does and um, has built up quite a reputation and he's the go-to guy for uh, a lawyer named alan greenspan uh, excuse me brian greenspan uh, and um when Jonathan Sherman and the Sherman family hired Mr. Greenspan um, to investigate this crime, uh, the first person he called was Tom Klatt. And I had made Mr. Klatt's appear, uh, acquaintance uh, during the Patrick Brown investigation. I was working with the uh, Patrick Brown uh, associates, um, and I was introduced to Mr. Klatt. Actually, coincidentally, I believe it was on the... Uh, uh, the first week or two after he'd uh, been on the uh, Sherman job. So it was it was uh, Barry and Honey's son Jonathan that hired Clat to investigate on behalf of the family as sort of like a um, an investigation that was happening simultaneously as the police investigation, which was separate. Or were they? Yes, yes, they were the private team, and and I believe that Jonathan. Uh, I, I'm not sure what his employment or arrangement was with uh, Mr. Clat. Uh, I, I, I'm under the assumption that he was, uh, Mr. Klatt was retained by Brian Green, Greenspan, uh, of course, uh, with Jonathan's approval, but Brian was the one heading up the investigation and Klatt's his go-to guy. And so you were Klatt's source then? Yes. Okay. Did he pay you at all? Yes. How much did he pay you? Uh, I'm not at liberty to discuss that. Okay. Can I signed I an agreement. Mind? They're in the Klondike papers. Okay. So, you know, those are public. Can I, can I ask why not? Well, basically I can speak on pretty much anything except for monetary compensation. Okay. Fair enough. Um, but there was a monetary compensation. Yes. Okay. And one thing that you told me that I found interesting uh, is that when you were um, helping out Clat, when you were his source, that he was keeping your identity and the information that you were giving him away from the family is that correct not the information the information was going through but tom was protecting me as a source okay not okay. just from jonathan sherman but also from brian greenspan okay so when you were um a paid source what 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 was the specific information that you were providing clot that he found to be compelling enough to want to put you on a payroll well originally um I had made Tom's acquaintance, as I said, during the Brown investigation. He was quickly off that. Um, and then we had uh, spoken on another couple of occasions uh, about other potential uh, uh, work. I had had a couple of people steered to me that I couldn't do the work, so I farmed it out to try to farm some out. Uh, we'd had previous subsequent conversations. And um, during that time, uh, the story for the reward broke in the paper. Um, I called Tom and uh, told him that uh, I would be interested in working with him. And I had some information because I had come across uh, something curious when I was last in Moscow and I was in late 2017. I had come across uh, expired, badly expired Apotex medication um, that was circulating, uh, not, not just a little bit, but a huge amount of medication. Um, was, and then Apotex, just for people, because I can see people in the comments saying they might be, it, it's hard to follow the story. So basically, um, the Shermans, or especially Barry, owned Apotex, which was a generic pharmaceutical company. Is that right? Yes, yes. They're a uh, pharmaceutical giant here in Canada, the Apotex uh, uh, company. And, and through my sources, we had found that there was much more uh, flooding the markets uh, in Europe than should be on, and it was very unusual. Uh, so I told Tom about that. We had met. Through that process, I met a uh, psychologist that was being paid for by the family through the private team uh, to ascertain suitability. And from there, I uh, made contact uh, 
uh, through some other sources, came up with there was a suspected uh, uh, new association between D'Angelo and uh, Jack K, Barry Sherman's, uh, I guess you would say, junior part, uh, um, right hand man. And I quickly learned uh, through sources that Jack K was being uh, allegedly blackmailed by Frank D'Angelo. I made contact with Frank D'Angelo uh, in a certain way, and he responded. And of course, we had several sub subsequent meetings. Um, yeah, this is a big rabbit hole. You know what? We should just call any segment that you're on um, called, and we should just call it "Look It Up." And every time you say shit that people have to look up, we just ding a bell. <laughs> so Google Frank D'Angelo. <laughs> you know what I mean? Google Apotex, um, because it is a hard story to follow. So that last part. Um, is confusing even to me and I kind of know the story. So so the implication um, or or some people might act or infer from the information that you just provided that counterfeit or, or expired medication sold with an Apotex logo on it um, mm -hmm. is happening. And um, and so lots will, shipping like, lots. Sorry, say that batch lots, shipping lots. Right. Is the, is the idea that Barry was doing this shit or that it was being done under his nose? I, I don't, I know that you, you might not know the answer to that. I'm just wondering like, what is the sort of going? No, it, it wasn't unusual that they are doing it. I mean, all pharmaceutical companies do it. This stuff goes around and around in circles. And uh, when they can't sell it in, in a particular market, because you can, you can um, sell expired medications up to a certain date in many different markets and all of them are different. However, this stuff was years gone. So all companies do this and they eventually end up dumping it in a charity bucket and writing down the full value of it. That's how it's oh. done. But it was unusual because there was so much, uh, um, of, I would say, this black market medication there from this one particular pharmaceutical giant. And what intrigued me was um, the people, the local people who were handling the black market, who were doing it, because that name rang a bell. It was from a uh, uh, part of a crime syndicate that does business in Miami, Florida. Okay. Allegedly. Oh, that's a fact. <laughs> See, this these are the this is this is the kind of shit that drives the Justin Lings of the world nuts, right? Like you just said something that is like a movie, just the last six seconds. <laughs> and, Can't help the way it is. It is in the papers. Like you're in headlights, just like all right. Okay, I, I can hear the Jason Bourne music uh, playing. Uh, Nathan, is is for, did you have a personal friendship or anything or an association with the Shermans? I, I knew them uh, socially, uh, uh, each, each of them separately, uh, Honey and Barry separately. Um, really liked them, um, but nothing to do with 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 this. I was. Very saddened to hear when when uh, they were murdered. Both both good people in their own rights. Very different, but very good people. Okay, um, we're gonna get back to you in a second, Nathan, because I, I kind of want to see if we can go chronologically and just boil it down like everyone in the world is five years old, David. Because we it, it is there's lots of tributaries, right? So um, to to sort of recap quickly. Um, you're a source on the Sherman investigation hired by the lead detective, hired by the family specifically, and you are unearthing information that shows that Barry and Honey's company, Apotex, um, was, as you say, uh, as like almost every other pharmaceutical giant, um, uh, selling some um, expired medication, and there's all these different avenues and loopholes that pharmaceutical companies can use. And there was one particular um, pharmacy that you're saying that that was uh, dealing in this counterfeit or expired not product. pharmacy. I'm talking about a crime syndicate that a was crime moving syndicate. this stuff. But okay. what was more um, um, intriguing to me was, was there was no way there was going to be this much weight. I don't care. You're you're dropping it all in one market, and it turns out that the vast majority of this expired medication was knockoff. It was an Apotex. It, it, it wasn't even it, it wasn't even close. It, so it was more like smuggling uh, or fraud. I don't know how you would put it, but you have a knockoff expired allegedly drug in a 
lot shipment, most of this stuff of truly expired Apotex drugs, but I think they were using them as a badge, so to speak, um, instead of actually this being all Apotex expired medication. Uh, in the market. Apotex, Apotex yeah. at one point had a distributor in Russia uh, and were legitimately selling. But uh, I believe that, that distributors license expired and I don't know what continued on, but uh, they would have built a name and a brand uh, in Russia, so it would be worthwhile as a generic to knock it off and to sell it as Canadian, meaning higher quality, okay. rather than I, I, Indian or Chinese. As, as the novice on this particular panel especially, as the novice in underworld political ecosystems right i i don't have much experience. what is the motive that one would infer from the fact that this crime syndicate company exists why did that result if you were to speculate i'm not asking you to like state facts here i'm just wondering Robert. why it's relevant does that does that just muddy the waters where, where it's like it could be them it could be this person over here it could be no it's guy. profit pure profit well, driven definitely pure profit and not only that but this particular syndicate the ties that they had that extended into miami they extended all the way into the exact same uh neighborhood say the uh, uh, association condo association whatever you want to call it that the shermans lived in in florida which i found unusual but but okay again i i feel really dumb I, i'm asking you specifically are you is this is the is the reason why this is relevant because um if barry sherman dies that cartel gets more money like why what's the motive the motive was to get rid of honey sherman honey sherman was the one who was about to blow the whistle on the uh, um uh, we'll call it flesh or flesh and blood and uh professional ties that conspired to basically defraud the company and therefore Barry and Honey personally to the tune of tens of millions of dollars. I would say hundreds of millions of dollars over a prolonged period of time. We're talking about people who worked at Apotex, uh, um, people in accounting, so to speak, and certain members of the family. That was the motivation and the people who were marketing this stuff, part of the crime syndicate, um, that was one arm. The other arm also, I believe, with very good reason, is uh, accomplices to this crime, accomplices with a certain uh, alleged family member who uh, may have been obligated uh, because of their, his partners, so to speak. Is it naive of me just to ask you as succinctly as I can, um, why, what did they do that made that, cartel or whatever it is syndicate want to take them out like what like how did that result in well they found out they were being fleeced that's what that's what okay. happened and instead of dealing in the barry's way which he had been wont to do i think if the ball was in honey's court this time and honey was going to bring the whole thing down oh. in fact my belief is that's why she returned from florida is apotex a still company that's functioning Yes, it's been sold. Interesting. Okay. Um, nobody has heard any of this information before, and I can almost hear the critics right now, and I actually don't care. Um, but I want to, I, I want to talk a little bit about how um, Nathan ended up getting involved even at all with this stuff. So can we kind of um, go from the point where you're giving this information to uh, Clat, uh, the, the information that you just relayed to us, and then just give me the chronological of what happened between there and when you and Nathan saw each other in Barry. I'm laughing because it's 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 the most unique story I've ever heard. <laughs> it really is. Well, it's I mean, it, it's. Uh, I was on a job. Uh, actually, this was 2019. I was uh, I was in Calgary. Actually, it was Stampede Week, and Clat uh, uh, and I had had a falling out a couple of months prior to that. Oh, oh they, they, uh, basically, they just I just interrupt. Uh, our, our getting together happened because of your trip to St. Petersburg and what then happened with uh, Patrick Brown. Yeah. And you, you might explain how, how that happened, how we met. Yeah, um, I was going to, right after this one, um, so Clat and I had a falling out, 
and um, out of the blue, I started uh, getting uh, uh, message requests. I got one from a guy named Adam Paulin. Uh, Adam Paulin turns out to be the childhood friend of Jonathan Sherman. And um, we struck up a conversation and uh, uh, I said, hey, look, if you want some of this information that I've gathered, I'd be more than happy to give it to you. Um, and uh, he expressed an interest in having it. And then he suggested that we meet. I was uh, told him it would be a couple of weeks until I got back. So when I did, we met. We met in Barry, And from there, um, this is all in the Klondike papers, the, the tickets, the messages, the the shoot match, the bank deposits. Uh, I met up with uh, Adam Paulin and uh, a gentleman, a uh, European gentleman, and the next thing I know is uh, taking an envelope full of cash and uh, the next week heading to Vienna, uh, Vienna, Austria, to meet with a private team. Uh, they told me they were the shadow investigation team that was watching class work, which I found to be uh, a little unusual. I mean, I was fully expecting by this point a, somebody like this to show up um so when i went in um i didn't have much backup i had a, a friend who was electronic backup but that city was a country away but when uh, you say in i don't know maybe i didn't pick it up but you said it but you're you're in vienna now yes yes i was in vienna met up with these people um i gave them some material and then i gave them a flash drive when they loaded the flash drive it, it wouldn't load they, they wouldn't do it. And I'm glad that uh, it didn't load. It was actually a Trojan um, to try to know what they knew. Um, but they weren't sure. So that's probably why I was able to walk out. When I got back, I informed Clatt to give him a heads up that there was a shadow team. And from the way they were acting, I didn't think that he knew about him. Uh, he didn't at all. And I believe, well, he told me flat out that supported by text messages I have in the Klondike papers that he quit working for Jonathan at that point. Um, I gathered okay. a, a, a I great to, deal. Sorry. I gathered a great deal more material over the months um, due to the um, helpfulness of, of the one who called himself Sid, the lawyer. Okay, uh, before, the, you on, before you go on, before you go on, because every time that you speak for a few minutes, we have to then do a recap of what you just said. <laughs> we have to, and we have to do it in bullet point because I'm telling you, I'm confused. So you're, you're, you're still investigating with Clatt. How did you end up in Vienna? I want that story again, even if you feel like you're being redundant, because I want the people at home to understand how it happened. Adam Paul and Jonathan Sherman's best friend arranged a meeting with me. It was actually in Barrie, Ontario. We met at the Jack Astors. It was the uh, end of July 2019. We met. Adam Paul and had a gentleman, a uh, foreign gentleman, accompany him to the meeting. This guy handed me an envelope with $6,000 in cash, um, told me it was, uh, they were grateful. Um, I gave them some material back to take with them. Uh, then I received a phone call. This individual who I had met at the uh, lunch meeting with Jonathan's best friend told me that they would like to debrief me and me to bring the rest of my material. Um, so I agreed to go. From there, a travel agent sent me a ticket to Vienna. Yeah, so, well, so, so just to pause there for a second, because this is why I think your life is a movie, and I would be like, why do I have to fucking go to Vienna? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, So wh what was their stated reason for having you go all the way to Europe in order to have a meeting with people? I believe if the meeting went the way they wanted it to, it would have been easier to dispose of me. Nathan, would you concur with that assessment? Um, I, that, it, it's one of two th things. Uh, that's definitely a possibility that uh, Vienna would be a, a good place uh, to dispose of David, but it's also a place that uh, the team was likely operating out of. So it was an opportunity to, rather than bring uh, four people to Canada to brief David, uh, to bring them into their territory uh, a control. And David, how did you survive the meeting? <laughs> like, seriously. Like, like, first of all, why did you go? Well, because I had to follow the trail. I had to find the answer. I mean, uh, in for a penny, in for a pound, right? I wanted to know who killed them people just as much as the next guy. So uh, if you're going to do something, do it all the way. 
Okay. Uh, so yeah. then you're there and you're in that room. And are you answering their questions in a way that you're almost like, look, I don't want to make them think that I'm doing this or that. Like, how do you approach the way that you talk to them? And Nathan, in that situation, should you just be even keel, economy of words, tell the truth, try not to die? Like, what is... Uh, I don't know about, about... You have to be even keel, never let them see you sweat, and uh, keep your answer simple. Okay. And that, is that what you did, David? Yeah, basically, you have to leave enough doubt so it's more, um, it's safer to let the person walk out and keep further tabs than it is to not know for sure. Because once you once you off somebody, then you can't take it back. And um, if there's potential damage and blowback from that, then there's no putting the toothpaste back in the tube. Okay. And if I'm understanding this correctly, the people in that room, in Vienna, uh, not even allegedly, I don't know what word you would put in front of it, but like, is is one possible working theory that they were the ones responsible and they were trying to see if you knew that they were the ones responsible? Is that where your mind is? I believe that they were a cleanup crew. Uh, I don't think that they did the perform the work themselves. Those people are almost certainly dead. Um, but they certainly were there to clean up uh, details and tie off loose ends of anybody who might who anybody who might be able to beyond a reasonable doubt uh, solve this thing because mm -hmm. i i do remember hearing and i don't remember if it was in the newspaper articles that um that the star was putting out or whatever but it was they were talking about how um it looked like a professional hit um because of the way that because of the ties that they used and also because of the there was camera footage of a person walking by and almost immediately and i couldn't tell nathan if this was just social media ridiculousness or or if someone actually had an, an actual report saying that um it looked like you know uh something that these uh like mer um, an israeli mercenary might do did you hear that uh, kind of thing too no the the, the way it was done would not lend one to believe that it was Israeli. Okay. Uh, it, it most certainly is, is, is not Israeli, but... I wasn't the, trying to say anything, by the, the way. The, the, way the, body, saying, like... the way the bodies were left in terms of a message, the way they were posed and the way it was done, uh, um, my immediate thought was uh, Russian or Mexican. So organized crime, though? Without a doubt, it was a professional hit. Yeah. Um, it, it being a professional hit, in, in, in that sort of murky world, how hard is it for a local police force to investigate? Well, it's really hard. Well, it, it's especially harder when, uh, as the police are going about investigating, suddenly there is a second uh, privately paid team uh, going through all the crime scene and, and, and murking things up. It makes it a lot harder for the police to do focus. And then, you know, while the investigation's still on, out of the blue, the house gets ripped out. You know, so the scene of the crime disappears. So there, there's a lot of things that, that were done to make it murky. Um, my understanding is that, uh, nevertheless, the uh, Toronto Police Services understand what happened. It's a matter of making sure that it's set up in a way that they can get a conviction and not egg on their face, and they're up against big boys. And I don't know if they'll get the actual team that did it. They're, they're long gone. They're long in the wind. Um, okay, David. Um, you're in Vienna. Um, you're at that meeting. How does the meeting end? And what was the last thing they sort of said to you? Did they give you instructions or did they say, we'll get back to you? Well, there was a series of meetings while we were in Vienna. I was uh, flown to Vienna and then I was booked into the in, uh, um, I can't remember. It's in the papers. I was booked into a very nice hotel in Vienna. Uh, then I received a series of messages over WhatsApp uh, by the one calling himself Johnny Walker. Uh, to be in a cab. So he would have a cab waiting for me or an Uber. 
I was taken to the International Hotel the first day. Uh, I was brought up very professional. The first gentleman who did the driving, who never spoke, he was obviously paramilitary. Uh, what persuasion, I'm not sure. He uh, spoke Hebrew, but uh, for some reason, I don't believe he was Israeli. Um, there was another girl. She was definitely Israeli. Or she called herself, uh, uh, oh, she was Alex. That's right, too. Uh, these are almost certainly not their names. Um, she was definitely ex-Israeli military, but private. And uh, the one calling himself Johnny Walker, I believe, uh, sounds to me, he could be Israeli, but, but more French. Um, that's the team. And I was brought in. I was strip searched. Uh, I was uh, checked me for weapons. They took my material. I had my flash drive. And um, luckily, uh, they loaded the flash drive. Um, and again, they said nothing loaded on it. It was a dud and uh, it was actually a Trojan that had been provided to me by a friend. Um, you, you, you have this like shit eating grin when you just said that. <laughs> You're like, because they tried so hard to get it to work. <laughs> okay. So when you leave the meeting and you come back to Canada, what went wrong? Because I want to get to the part of the story where you're in Barrie. Yeah. What went wrong is when we went out for dinner, uh, they had the one who identified himself as Sid and the girl, Alex, uh, take me out from the hotel and uh, go for dinner in Vienna. So we did the downtown and then they pulled the excuse, you know, looking at the phones, looking where we going. There's a good restaurant here. What they were doing is they were reconning to try to see who my backup was. Um, I passed a couple of the individuals, but um, I had noticed a few things that, that definitely gave me the impression that uh, this was not a private shadow team uh, looking to solve this thing. This was a suppression team. Um, so when I got back, of course, last thing I wanted to do was communicate further with them, um, except at strategic points. I was more interested in the information I would be getting back from them, thanks to their their uh, uh, generosity at loading that drive. Did you? Okay, sorry. I just want to just trace back for one quick second. Did you give them a, a, a your own sort of um, opinion on what you think may have transpired? And when you answered that question, if you did, were you answering it strategically so they didn't think you were onto anything that they had any knowledge of? Oh no, I, I wanted them to know. I had led right up to the bridge where it could go to two or three different places and nowhere else, and I told them that I was you know, with their assistance, if they wanted me to continue to look into it and, you know, basically play the game. It's clear by my questions that I personally would have been dead within 20 seconds of entering that room in Vienna, uh, because this is just, it's a high stress situation. Okay. So now you're back home hmm. and you notice something when you're living in Barry. Look, can we go to that part? Am I skipping too much? If I Yeah. Can? Well, no, I mean, we're, uh, I, I I'll give I give I gave Clad a heads up because I mean at this point I wasn't uh, I wasn't I hadn't come to certain conclusions that my investigation took me to, so I gave Tom a heads up and said, "Hey, you've got this team, so uh, you know everything." This is was after cool. you're falling in with Clad, right? Yeah, and then everything was cool, uh, but then I noticed that we were being shadowed. Myself and a former associate who worked with me, who I won't name, uh, because he chose to retire. Uh, but we were being shadowed. Uh, he noticed it first. And uh, then again, yes, we were. And then we noticed that our houses were being sat on. They were being staked out. There were cars that were showing up in both of our neighborhoods for prolonged periods of time and people driving by. And it, it, none of it made any sense, but it started to get pretty rough. And uh, we had a couple of attempted break-ins. Uh, we had some windows smashed. We had uh, We had some it was just a clear case of, of harassment. So this had gone on for months, and I finally asked uh, Nathan. Nathan thought I was being paranoid that nobody would risk it, and uh, that's where Nathan comes in. Nathan, okay, so you, so you're, you're chilling at home, playing with the dog, and you get a phone call, and it's David. And what's going on? What does he say? I wanted to see what was happening, and uh, from everything that David was was making out um he was being harassed uh it was purely a game of intimidation um i think david can state based on the license plates of some of the vehicles that uh Clatt, in fact uh was involved 
uh, in what was going on. And what I wanted to do was turn the tables and turn the hunters in, into the hunted. And um, I drove up. I picture up. you, Nathan. I'm sorry, but I'm sorry to cut you off. But I do picture you in your house being like, I'll be right there. And then going to the kitchen and then going like this to the coffee grinder and the wall kind of spins. And then all of uh, your like assortment of weapons and shit are on the other side of the wall. <laughs> Nothing like that. Okay. Um, so it's on, on two separate occasions. I uh, raced up to Barry. One time I, I, I took a person. And, and these people absolutely freaked yeah. because suddenly the hunted, the, the hunters became hunted. And, and they were fleeing like rats from a sinking ship. And it was actually fun chasing them around the streets of, of Barrie and cutting them off. And uh, they, were, they were scared. And uh, I, I'm sure that uh, they very quickly reported up the ladder the license plate of, of my vehicle, which happens to be one of the same license numbers as what I have in Moscow. And uh, so they, whoever they were working for understood that the situation has changed. Uh, now, when you, when you say that, it makes me feel like, oh, David, these guys were like jokers. Like they weren't serious threats. The, um, I, is that just because Nathan they was so tough? They, they, they were there to play a game of intimidation. These weren't people that one would hire um, to do wet work, work to, to, to hurt David. Um, what they were just trying to do was scare him off. Pretty much. That's it. And, uh, you know, I wasn't sure which way the wind blowed, but uh, some of the, because we had cameras all around. And one of the nights that Nathan, uh, myself, and another associate uh, went into the Walmart parking lot, and uh, we basically cornered one of them. The other cars came to the defense, I guess, because they thought Nathan was pulling a, a weapon. But um, they acted very strangely. They were all just the way they were flashing their lights at each other. But we had a, another associate, I did, um, across who was strategically hidden, who had taken down all the plate numbers. And when we ran those numbers, uh, uh, the next day I had met up with Platt because he, he basically said he wanted to take a look around, that there was nobody following me. Um, he said, I have my own people here. I noticed that one of his own people, it was the same woman who was in the parking lot the night before with this group that Nathan and I had tracked down and it was the same plate number. So, gotcha. Yeah. Um, I, I want to know, Nathan, um, and, and David, actually, but Nathan, I'll start with you. Um. I, I know that we can't be, be making accusations and like and and trying to frame something as factual, but just as a story itself, um, it, are we to assume that the Toronto police, who are investigating, are looking in the directions that we are alluding to tonight regarding the people in Vienna and regarding the other? involvement in Miami and people like that is is that something that the police are actively doing and maybe they haven't I, reported on it for whatever I, reason I, I can't speak specifically to, to uh, Vienna or Miami but uh, in conversations that I've had with uh, friends that are senior members um, not in homicide but in Toronto Police Services uh, they know who contract. They believe they know who contracted um, the murders, but it's a very difficult thing to. Do. They don't want to lay charges and then have it come apart for all kinds of reasons, such as deep pockets and legal strength, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, they're very frustrated by it, but they believe that they understand. Um, what happened. David, isn't there some infighting in the family between the kids? Yeah, um, I would say that the, um, you have the, 
the oldest sister, I believe she's the old Alex, um, and uh, her husband on one side, and uh, several family members, and uh, you have Jonathan and uh, his uh, his side on the other. So it's uh, dueling investigations, uh, so to speak. So they're investigating separately. So there's three total investigations, or just the Jonathan and the Alex one? Well, there's the ongoing Toronto Police Service investigation. Right which is will never close until it's closed um then you have the uh, uh, uh to this day I, I i don't know if if jonathan has a, a team per se the last i heard he had a gentleman named uh, grady former toronto homicide uh, detective uh, working for him but i don't know if that investigation is still ongoing uh but the family of course has their own the other side has their own legal representation and they're both uh, approaching this from separate camps. So I'll let people make of that what they will. Okay. Um, we have to go in about 10 minutes. I, I just want to ask you, Nathan, is it, what am I not thinking of asking? <laughs> because I'm so unfamiliar with this kind. To me, honestly, like, like if you were, if someone were to put a gun to my head and be like, what do you really think, James? I'd be like, everything's fucking corrupt. As long as you got money, you can get away with shit. Uh, I, I, you know, I, you can buy anything, you know, like, Am I a pessimist or a realist? What am I? Well, first, first of all, you're being a realist in that um, without evidence, one cannot be coming out with actual names. Um, it, it, it's just too, too threatening um, in, in our litigious society. Uh, one has to leave it to the police. One can believe what one may believe, but there's really nothing that that you can do. Um, that rule only applies to rich people, though. Like, if you're a poor person, if you're, uh, among, like, if you're a poor black dude, and, and your name's out there immediately, even before you get arrested. Yep. <laughs> you know I mean? like, yeah, yeah. That's how it works. I can do that after being that close for that long, going to the places I went, meeting with the people I met. Um, who were involved in this firsthand and uh, basically chasing a, a, a wild rabbit, so to speak, around the globe. I've no doubt in my mind exactly who did it. I've no doubt in my mind the exact reasons it was done. And I've no doubt in my mind that um, um, this will, no reward will ever be paid. And that is partly why we are executing the launch of the new podcast the fix from the pope mobile and that's where the <laughs> beauty is going to be held because jesus christ um yeah okay um i i think that uh, i joke about um the 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 stuff that i'm hearing almost as a defense mechanism um at the end of the day it is not funny it was a heinous crime um Absolutely. it was really sad um the people that i know that knew them as acquaintances had had only really nice things to say about them and i don't know you know i'm just i'm just saying and like, I, I didn't really hear much the only thing that i heard that was negative about either one of those um people uh was that uh barry um didn't like to pay his debts he was, he was <laughs> a nice. uh, it's good apotex apotex is a whole generic pharmaceutical company uh, pharmaceutical industry uh survive on litigation and breaking the patents that other corporations have invested billions of dollars in developing. And um, he would reverse engineer and take it to court and win. So he was a, known to be a very litigious person um, on a lot of fronts. Um, I really liked him. I thought he was a terrific guy. Uh, they were wonderful in the community, and I would really love to see closure. It, it's horrible that there, uh, the years have passed and, and there's no closure. I agree. They, uh, nobody deserves what they got, and i got to tell you something. It's not going to be long because they know, they, they know you did it. And you know who I'm talking to. They know you did it. And no matter how many teams or experts and how much witness or evidence might have been withheld from certain scenes, they know. And it will eventually catch up. 
because these people will rest easy. And that's a, that's a promise. Um, thank you, David. That was, that was actually a good speech. I, I felt like saying cut and going, well done, everybody. That was great. Because <laughs> that was a good speech. It really was. It was, it was a good speech. Um, again, I'm using humor as a defense because I have nothing to offer this conversation except really on crazy questions and like just me sitting here all guffawed, um, which is a real word. We are going to do a part two because guess what, kids? We have receipts for basically all of the things that you said tonight, correct? We have audio. We have receipts from airliners and hotels and audio recordings and emails and texts and all this stuff. Um, and I, and I, maybe I, I, I didn't do it correctly, but I, I feel like it went okay. I wanted to just talk about it tonight and then give the details in part two, um, like I, the receipts. I, I just think it's easier. Yeah. I, I think everything that David has and and being able to address it, you're going to be able to leave it with your listening audience to be able to come to their own conclusions. That doesn't mean okay. that it will be addressed in the justice system, but with everything that uh, David has and everything that he's been through on this, um, there'll be... Uh, I think a form of, of closure in the in the public. Nope. Well, I hope so. Um, I hope, um, yeah. I mean, I, I I hope that the truth is unearthed, and I hope uh, whoever did it pays a price. And um, we'll talk about why the thirty five million dollar reward seemed weird. Maybe the next time, because um, mm. yeah, we're we're out of time now. Nathan Jacobson, David Wallace, thank you very much. Um, sorry about the audio issues, guys. Um, Nathan, I would love to have you back sometime in the next couple months just to, just to like talk about your biography because we had a conversation on the phone today and yesterday that I think uh, just really it's, compelling. It's funny. Open... That? Last night I was with a, a very close friend of mine that um, we served in the, the same battalion forever ago. He was uh, a demolitions expert. And he said to me, just take the next year and write your book. Just relax. He said, you have a wonderful woman in your life. Just relax, write your book, and travel. I'm just going to throw this out there for the 27th time in my life to the 27th person. If you need a biographer, Nathan, I'm here for you, buddy. Okay? If you need someone to travel around the world with you and your new wife, <laughs> interviewing you in several different places, I'm your man. Okay? Just throwing that out there. Exchange. No problem. One day. Nathan Jacobson, David Wallace, thank you guys for joining us. I really appreciate Hell it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, someone's joking in the comments um, that isn't casual Friday supposed to start in 10 minutes? No, motherfuckers. Four minutes. Um, so we'll see you in like 12 minutes. <laughs> no problem. <clears throat> uh, we'll see you next time on Black Bolt. I don't, I'm not even going to change my shirt. Black ball. Black, black, black ball. Black, 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 black ball. Black, 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 black ball.